of that medley of songs about grace. Josh, that's one of your spelling words this week, right? Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. You want to use that as an acrostic. Of course, mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And I am so thankful that God gives us both. He gives us mercy. He gives us grace. And uh, ladies, thank you for that reminder and song tonight. But if you would, take your Bibles. Turn to Genesis chapter 44. Genesis chapter 44. We will not read all of the verses, but all of the verses in Genesis chapter uh, 44 uh, are going to be involved in tonight's message. But we're going to just read a few of these, and then as we make our way through the uh, sermon together, we're going to be hitting verses as we go. So I hope you'll leave your Bibles out, because we're going to be looking at all kinds of various things. But let's go ahead and read the first several verses of Genesis chapter 44, starting in verse 1. Genesis 44, starting in verse 1. And he commanded the steward of his house, and it's... It's a good idea when you go to a new chapter like that to remember who it's talking about from the previous chapter, especially if it begins with a pronoun like he. Who is he? It's talking about Joseph. And Joseph commanded the steward of his house, Joseph's house, saying, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put every man's money in his sack's mouth. And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn money and he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men. When thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing." And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words, God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold the money which we found in our sacks mouths, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of my, thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die. And we also will be my Lord's bondmen. Now, we're going to stop there, uh, but we will deal with the rest of that story. Tonight is entitled, or tonight's message is entitled, The Mystery of the Missing Silver Cup. Isn't that a good title? The Mystery of the Missing Silver Cup. It reminds me of maybe a Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew mystery title. Doesn't it sound like one of those? I remember I loved reading those when I was a kid. Um, uh, yeah, of course, you know, you go to the library when you're a kid, and they got all those books there, and, 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 and almost always I would end up in that section of the library. And I would check one of those out a lot of times. I read both of them. I read Nancy. As a matter of fact, I think I read more Nancy Drew mysteries than I did Hardy Boards mysteries. But anyway, I think I've read all of them. But I, I love those stories. And then, of course, you know, that was during the school year, but then... During the summer, you didn't go to the library like you had at school, and they would send something. Now, the older folks know exactly what I'm about to talk about, but the younger folks don't have a clue, all right? They, they don't get this, but I want the younger folks to listen to me here. In the summer, they would send the library to you. In other words, there was like a short bus that would come and park beside your house or in your neighborhood and you could go to that short bus, the librarian or the, the driver there would be sitting there and she'd leave it running because it was hot, you know, and they'd have, I, I, I used to love that because they had air conditioner inside of that. So it was worth it just to get on the, the bookmobile. And that's what they called it, the bookmobile. And you got up there and you looked all through those books. And again, during the summer, I would do the same thing. I would look for the Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew section because those stories were so good. They were full of suspense. They were full of danger. I mean, they were always getting into trouble, but they could always find a way to get out. And I love that. And, you know, there was mystery involved, and, and you had all these intriguing characters, and so there was suspense and intrigue. And, all. And, and as I got older, I found out those books actually had a lot of good lessons in them. I mean, good, practical life lessons. You don't find books like that anymore. 
Not that our kids read books anymore, but anyway, if you could find books like that, they probably couldn't. Uh, there are probably not very many out there with a lot of good life lessons in them. But I love those stories. I like to find those stories and read those stories, and I couldn't wait to get to the end to find out how they were going to get out of the mess that they were in and who the criminals were so that I could finish the story and I could start another one. Well, there are a lot of places and points in Joseph's story that is a lot like that. You just cannot wait to find out what's going to happen. What's going to happen next in the story? All the events that we've talked about so far, all these different things that have been happening in Joseph's life are at the point they're very quickly coming together. God has been working. We've seen him do that through his story. God has been working many times behind the scenes. The characters didn't know what was really happening behind the scenes, but God did. And God was working, and he is using all kinds of things to change and mold the hearts of the characters that are involved. You know, God uses some strange things sometimes to speak to people's hearts. I mean, in the Bible, you find story after story where God used unusual methods and unusual means to get the attention of certain people. I think about Moses. Moses out there minding his own business, looking after his father-in-law's animals, and what does he see off in the distance? A burning bush. Now, that was unusual, right? And by the way, you could spend a lot of time tonight, and I did this in my own mind this week, was looking at what God used in relation to each character. I think there's something to that. Um, and, and, and again, you do your own study on that, but I, I thought it was fascinating to study that out this week. But God used a burning bush to get Moses' attention. He used a talking donkey. Can you imagine a talking donkey to get the attention of Balaam? He used a bleeding sheep to get the attention of King Saul. He used a touch, a meal, a still small voice to get the attention of Elijah. He used a slave girl to speak to Naaman. And he even used a crowing rooster to get the attention of Peter. He grabbed his attention, didn't he? And that's exactly, and I find that very interesting that he would use a rooster because Peter was always crowing, wasn't he? And, and again, I, 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 it's fascinating to put those two things together. But the list could go on and on, but that is enough to prove the point tonight. God will use whatever is necessary to get to a person's heart. To bring the message that the person needs to hear, he will use whatever it is. Now, we see God demonstrating that again in our text. As we see this mystery unfold in front of us, God uses a silver cup to lead this family, this family that we've grown close to over the last several weeks. We've gotten to know a little better over the last several weeks. But he uses this silver cut to bring them to the point of forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation. So let's take a look tonight at the elements of the mystery of the missing silver cup. Notice the first element. We see a conspiracy taking place. Joseph and his brothers have just enjoyed, this is where we left them last week, they've just enjoyed a meal together. They have sat around the table, they have laughed, they've eaten, they may have made small talk amongst one another, but the brothers still don't know it's Joseph. They still haven't recognized him, even though there's been a few hints here and there. You remember uh, Joseph uh, had his brothers to sit around that table in birth order. That should have been clue number one, right? Because only Joseph and maybe his dad and maybe his brothers would know the birth order, right? Nobody else would know that. And here somehow he's put them all in order. And then you remember when they were handing out the food, serving the food, they brought five times as much food and put it in front of Benjamin rather than giving the food to his brothers. Again, clue number two. So there's clues being laid out there, but they're just not getting it. So now the meal's over. A night has gone past. It's the next day. And the brothers are, well, they're feeling pretty good about things. I mean, things seem to be going their way. They've convinced the prime minister of Egypt that they are not spies. They've rescued their brother Simeon from prison. They're about to return home with the grain that they came for because their family was in need. 
They've taken care of the money situation. Maybe it was a mishap. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. They don't know, but they've given that money back from the first trip. And very importantly, they're going to return home with their brother Benjamin. And remember, Judah had put his life on the line with Daddy Jacob and said, we will bring him back. I promise. And so they're going to get to bring him back. So things are looking good. They're no doubt excited about returning home. I mean, to share with the their family, the stories that they've experienced while they're away. They can't wait to go back. They're probably congratulating one another about how successful this mission to Egypt has been. But what they don't know is that God is about to bring them face to face with a sin that they thought had been covered. A sin that they've hid all these years. A sin that they tried not to think about. A sin they committed some 22 years ago. So what happens? The brothers are getting ready to leave. We just read it in verse 1. Joseph tells his steward, he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to fill their bags full of grain. Matter of fact, verse 1 tells us uh, that he gave them as much as they could carry. So he is being abundant in his giving here of grain. He also tells the steward to give them their money back again. So won't that be a surprise, right? They're going to get their money back for this grain. And then, what is really strange, he tells him to take his own personal silver cup and put it in the top of one of the bags. And not just any bag. To put it in the top of Benjamin's bag, the youngest boy. Joseph's full brother. Put it in his bag. Seal it up. Don't let him see what's inside the bag. After he gives the brothers a a chance to get a head start, he sends his steward after them to confront them about the cup in Benjamin's sack. And when he stops them, he accuses them, notice, of rewarding evil for good. Why is he accusing them of rewarding evil for good? Because Joseph has shown them nothing but kindness. But yet they have stolen something from Joseph. They have stolen his personal silver cup. Well, the brothers, of course, deny the whole thing. I mean, we didn't do anything wrong. What are you accusing us for? Matter of fact, they are so sure of their innocence that they make a very bold promise. Look at it again in verse 9. With whomsoever of thy servant it be found. You find that cup in any one of our sacks. And you can see the name tag on every sack, right? This is Judah's sack. This is Simeon's sack. This is Benjamin's sack. You find that cup in any of our sacks. Both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. In other words, ever whose sack you find him in, you can put him to death, and the rest of us will be your slaves. That's what the promise was. Now, this seems to be a strange way for Joseph to treat his brothers. Right, he showered them with kindness so far. He's just fed them food. But God is using Joseph. He is using Joseph to help his brothers come to a place of repentance, a place that they have not yet been. Remember, they are still covering the sin. They are still covering from one another. Every time probably Joseph's name came up in a conversation, they probably looked at one another. Why? Because there's guilt, there's shame. They have not repented of the sin. And so God is going to use Joseph to bring them to that place. Years before, these men had conspired against Joseph to get rid of him. They tried to do evil to him, but now the tables are turned. Now Joseph is conspiring against them, but not to do evil but rather to do them good. This is all for their good. Now what we got to remember is this. There are no accidents in life. If you are a child of God, then every single thing that happens in your life is a product of God's divine providence. God is looking out for you. He wants what's best for you. That's what Joseph is doing here for his brothers. And that is what God is doing through Joseph for his brothers. He is looking out for their good. God is continually working in our life, many times in ways that we can't even comprehend. 
Many times in ways that we don't understand, and even if we could know about him, we couldn't explain what he was doing. We couldn't see where he was headed, but God's always got a plan. Now, this is also true in even how God deals with our sins. And I want you to think about this for a moment. There are times when we sin that immediately that guilt comes. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit sets on us and we immediately say, God, I am so sorry. I repent of that sin. Please forgive me. That's what should happen. That's the best thing that could happen. But sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we want to hang on to our sin, whatever it is. We try to make excuses for it. We try to cover it up like the brothers did. And we let it hang around. We let that sin just stay in our life for a while, and the longer it stays in our life, the more comfortable we get with it. And the less we feel guilty about it. The less we're convicted by it. So we let it stay. And we think that we've gotten away with it because God hasn't done anything about it. Now, I know none of our kids ever feel that way about your parents, right? Well, I got away with it. Mom and Dad didn't do anything about it. We probably all felt that when we were growing up. But God hasn't done anything. But God knows all about it. He, look, his eyes are in every place. He saw exactly what we did. He heard what we said. He saw where we went. He knows about our sin. But sometimes he waits. Because he knows exactly when and how to speak to our hearts about it. So when he decides the time is right, he will use whatever is necessary to humble us. He will use whatever is necessary to convict us, to lead us to repentance. We have a great example of this in the Old Testament. You remember the time when Absalom, Absalom was King David's son. Absalom killed his brother Amnon because Amnon had raped their sister Tamar. And you can imagine that murder created a rift in between the relationship between David and Absalom. Matter of fact, it was such a rift that King David said, I want you out of my sight. He basically expelled him out of his kingdom for two years. Now, in that two-year span, Absalom decides, you know what? It was pretty good living with, with Papa David. I, I like it back there. And I'm going to try to make things right. I'm going to try to reconcile. But he doesn't go to King David. He doesn't go to his dad to reconcile. He decides it would be easier on him if he went through an in-between, a mediator. And so he goes to David's general, Joab. And he, and he sends word for Joab. Joab, I want you to come to me. I want to talk to you about this. I need your help. General Joab didn't come. He refused his calls. And so Absalom, to get his attention, he had one of his servants go out and set Joab's barley fields on fire. And as they're blazing, then General Joab decides, you know what, maybe it is a good idea for me to go to talk to Absalom about these things. But it took his fields being set on fire in order to get his attention. Now here's the point of sharing that story. Each of us has something, something. You fill in the blank for you. Each one of us has something in our life that if God were to touch it, or God would take it, it would get our attention. Now that's a sobering thought, isn't it? Because what are the dearest and nearest things to your heart? What are the things that mean the most to you? Whatever that something is, God doesn't have a problem touching it and taking it if it moves you to the place where he wants you to be. He doesn't have a problem touching it or taking it if it gets your attention. Now, he would rather go through other means to get our attention. He would rather use his word to speak to us and let us pay attention to that. He would rather use the preaching of God's word. He would rather use his still, small voice and us to perk up and pay attention. But if we won't listen to those things, then he will touch or he will take 
whatever it is. The best thing a believer can do with sin that, that comes into our life, again, is to confess it as soon as possible. Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. When we don't do that, it's when the high price must be paid. So what God is doing in these verses with these brothers, He's burning their barley fields. He is doing it, though, in a subtle way by trying to get their attention through this little silver cup. I want you to notice the second thing. We see a confrontation. At this point, the steward is standing there. The brothers are lined up. They're lined up from youngest to the oldest. They've got their sack in front of them. And he starts undoing those sacks. Comes to the first brother. He opens the sack, the oldest brother, and there's nothing in there. But I can imagine the brothers just standing there looking at one another with their arms folded. Can't you see them? They're looking at one another. They probably got this smug look on their face. Like, God, this guy's wasting his time. We hadn't stolen anything. He's accusing us. He, look, he's going to look foolish in a minute. They're looking at one another. They're kind of snickering at one another. And all the way down, their confidence keeps growing. Sack after sack after sack, but suddenly, the last sack, Benjamin's sack is open. And all that smugness and all that confidence shattered just like that. What? Well, how did that get there? Where, where, where did that come from? They're stunned. They're shocked. They've been put in a position that they would have never imagined being in, even moments before. What are they going to do? Now, this is the moment of truth in their life. This is Joseph's final test for them. They've already been given tests, and they've passed all the tests so far. Remember, they brought Benjamin back as Joseph had requested. That was test number one. They came back to get their brother Simeon. That was test number two. They even returned with the grain money that was given back from their first trip. That was test number three. But this is the ultimate test. All those years before, they had hated Joseph. They had hated Joseph so much that they threw him in a pit and they sold him into slavery. They had broken their father's heart by lying to him about what had happened. And they had held on to that lie for all these years and now is their opportunity to get rid of the other son of Rachel. They got rid of the first one, Joseph. But now they can get rid of Rachel's other son, Benjamin. This is their opportunity. What will we do? I mean, the Bible has already made it clear to us that he loved Benjamin. Jacob loved Benjamin. And maybe he had even doted on Benjamin even more because he had lost Joseph. Maybe, you know, Joseph was his favorite son, but Joseph wasn't around anymore. In Jacob's mind, Joseph was killed by a wild beast. But at least I got Benjamin. And maybe now he has made Benjamin his favorite. Maybe he's given Benjamin, the Bible doesn't say this, but maybe he's given Benjamin a colorful coat. Maybe he's given him the title of head of household. And all the boys have watched. They've watched Benjamin take the place of Joseph. We thought we got rid of him. And now Benjamin, there he is. This is their opportunity. What will they do? All the brothers have to do is allow Benjamin to be arrested. That's all they got to do. Just let him be arrested. He'll be removed from their family forever. And now they can just go home and tell the truth. I mean, the, before they went home and they had to make up a lie to get rid of their brother. Now they just go home. Well, we didn't have anything to do with it. We don't know how the cup got there. Benjamin must have done it. And they just go home and tell the truth. It was that prime minister of Egypt that took our brother from us. It would break their father's heart, but they've seen that before. This is the ultimate test. They don't know it, but they're about to reveal to Joseph what kind of men that they've become. I love this. Thankfully, they passed this test with flying colors. What is their response? They don't know how Benjamin's cup got in the sack. 
At this point, it doesn't matter how the cup got in Benjamin's sack. All that matters to them is that their brother has been accused and they are determined to face it with him. They're not going to forsake their brother. They're going to stand with him. You see, here are ten men who are finally ready to do the right thing. Here are ten men who have grown to the point that they're finally seeing beyond themselves. Here are ten men who are going to do right no matter what it costs. By the way, that is the same place that God desires for every one of us to reach. God wants us to stop making excuses for our behavior. God wants us to stop blaming other people for what we do. God wants us to accept the responsibility of who we are and what we've done. God wants us to reach, to the, pl reach the place where we're willing to do the right thing regardless of what it costs us. Now, have you gotten to that place yet? Don't answer out loud. But I will tell you this, if you haven't gotten to that place yet, I want you to know you can get there with God's help. Look how patient God has been with these boys. He has allowed 22 years to go by and he keeps chipping off and chipping off and chipping off and molding and shaping and now he has brought them to this place. What a patient and understanding God that we have. What a God of mercy and a God of grace. You see this is so evident in their life. Look at the final thing. We see a confession. Verse 14 tells us that when the brothers arrive back at Joseph's palace, he's still there. He was probably waiting to see who would show up. Who's going to come back? I know we're going to accuse Benjamin. That's part of the plan. He come up with the plan. But I wonder if any of the other guys will come back with him. I wonder if any of them have changed. You know what? I was thinking this week, I wonder maybe if this, it may be a part of Joseph's plan, could have been to do this for the safety of Benjamin. I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not. Because if they accuse Benjamin and they bring Benjamin back to Joseph, Joseph is only going to take care of Benjamin. He knows he's not guilty. He didn't take the cup but he'll take care of him. But if his brothers have not changed, then Benjamin is likely, go, he will go through some of the same abuse that Joseph went through. So I'm wondering if maybe in his mind he is trying to protect his brother. I don't know. Again, we're not told that. But what we are told is that when the brothers do get back to where Joseph is, their first reaction is to bow down before him. Now isn't that something? You remember those two dreams that those boys said will never come true? Well, let's see what happened to the dreamer's dreams now. They came true. Joseph's sheaf was standing there in his dream and his brothers and dad and their sheaves are standing around and they are bowing down to him in that dream and look at what's happening there in the palace. They're bowing down. Again, they still don't know it's Joseph. But they're bowing down to the prime minister. That was a fulfillment of God's promise. God always keeps his promises, doesn't he? Joseph now confronts his brothers about the silver cup. He leads them to believe that he is able to see what they've done. That he is able to divine. The scripture, King James uses that word divine. You see, divination was something that was practiced in the Egyptian culture. And I think it's very, very interesting. One of the ways that they would practice divination was that they would take a silver cup, a silver goblet. They would put wine in that cup. And then they would put jewels in the cup. And they would read those jewels like some people today pretend to read tea leaves. Now, by the way, reading tea leaves is a bunch of hooey. I hope you know that, right? It's not, it's not real. And by the way, Joseph wasn't performing divination either. What is he doing He's tightening the screws a little bit. He's putting a little bit more pressure on his brothers to see if they'll crack, to see if this is a facade, if this is, if this is a, a, just a mask that they're wearing. You know, they're bowing. Of course they're going to bow. But where's their heart? And then here is the turning point of the whole story. Judah steps up. And I think that's a good way of putting it. He stepped up. He became a man at this point. 
he stepped up and he says some things that shows how far he's matured. Look at verse 16. And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. What is he doing? He's confessing. He's not confessing to this sin. He's not guilty of this sin. He is confessing to their sins from 22 years before. God has found out. Be sure your sin will what? Find you out. God has found out the iniquity, the sin of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Joseph said, I'm not hearing that. No, you get up. You leave. I've already said, he's the guilty one. Benjamin's the guilty one. He's going to be held accountable. But Judah doesn't back down. Verse 18, then Judah came near unto him and said, by the way, that phrase coming near means he became more passionate in what he was saying. He was saying, please listen to me, what I'm saying to you. What are you saying, Judah? Oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child in his old age, a little one. And his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother. And it, 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 it sounds like he's just rattling at that point, right? That's what you do when you're nervous and you're trying to come up with words, but he's, he's telling the truth. This is exactly what's happened. He's replaying all the events. Everything is just rushing out like, a, like an emotion, like a wave coming forth. Verse 21, And thou sayest unto thy servant, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Thou saidest unto thy servant, Except our, your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord, and our father said, Go again and buy us little food. And he's telling the whole story of what took place when he went home. He said, he, he said we couldn't go down, and then he said we could go down with him. Verse 29, And if you take this also from me, and mischief befall him, he shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to my grave. Where is his concern, by the way? His concern is about his daddy. He's worried about Jacob. They, didn't, they weren't concerned about that 22 years ago. They didn't care about breaking daddy's heart, but now he's concerned. Now, therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave, a servant became surety for the lad and to my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. Now his concern has shifted. It was on his father, now it's on his brother. Let me take his place. Let me suffer the blame. What has he learned to do? He's learned that to put others ahead of himself. He's put his father ahead of himself. He's put his brother ahead of himself. When Joseph hears what Judah says, you can read the rest of the verses there. Joseph sees their heart. He sees the men that they've become, the change that has taken place, and Joseph loses it. You remember he lost it before. <laughs> his emotions got the best of him and had to run off in, the, in his inner chamber because his mascara was flowing. But now he doesn't care. You know, he's, he, he's losing it right in front of his brothers and he reveals to his brothers finally who he is. I wonder if any of the brothers said, I thought that was you. They probably didn't. But he told them who he was. Now we're going to pick up the story there next week, but I want to... I wanna, Press home two things and we're done. The first thing that I see in the story tonight is this. Sin is a very selfish thing. Sin is a selfish thing. When sin entered into the world, it entered because Adam and Eve chose themselves over the Lord. They put themselves. And by the way, when we sin, every sin that we commit, 
is still rooted in selfishness. Our sins are all about us. When we sin, we choose ourselves over every other person and every other thing. What we're saying is, I want what I want, and I don't care about the consequences. When we sin, we're choosing ourselves over God. We're choosing ourselves over what He wants. We're choosing uh, what we want over the church, our family, over everything except for what we want. But when our hearts are as they should be, as we've seen in the latter part of this story with Judah, the Lord, His will, the needs of others go ahead. They go before what we want. And by the way, that is how that you know you are growing in the Lord. When you refuse to sin because you are concerned about how it will affect the Lord's work and how it will affect others. Again, it's not all about me. A lot of people decide not to sin because they're afraid of being caught. That's why they don't do wrong. I'm afraid of being caught. But a growing believer decides not to sin because he sees the damage it'll do to the church. He sees the damage it'll do to his marriage, to his home, to his family, to others, to the Lord's work. Number two, when we do sin, we must deal with it quickly and honestly. I'm sure that if these brothers could have gone back and done it again, they probably wouldn't have committed the sin to begin with, but I promise you they wouldn't have waited so long to get that burden off of them. When we do what we're supposed to do with sin, we confess it quickly, we confess it honestly, then the Lord will forgive us and He will restore us. And then sin is put behind us and we can move forward. It's it's pretty hard to move forward when sin's dragging you down. Question number one tonight, are you growing in the Lord? A good way to know that you're growing is when you notice that you're hating sin more and more. A good way that you know that you're growing is when you're willing to tell the truth about your sin. And then a good way to know that you're growing is when you get to the place where you're more concerned about others than yourself. Question number two, are there sins in your life that need to be confessed? If there are sins that need to be confessed, I encourage you to confess them, repent of those things, while the Lord is still using preaching to get to your heart. While the Lord is still using His Word, while you can still hear His still, small voice, deal with your sins then. Because if you don't, then God knows what to touch. He knows what to take. And don't be surprised if you find a silver cup somewhere in your grain bag. Would you stand to your feet tonight? We're going to give the invitation this way, those two questions. First of all, is it your desire to grow in the Lord? There in the stillness of this moment, there in your seat, I'm going to ask Sister Pam to come forward, just play through a hymn of invitation, just play through a couple verses, but right there, right where you stand at your seat, I want you to ask yourself that question, am I growing in the Lord? Did anything in this message tonight hit home with me? Did it cause me to think about a way, an area of my life that needs work? Maybe tonight your desire is to grow. You want to grow closer to the Lord. You want to grow more like Him. You want to be what He wants you to be. You want to live the life that He wants you to live. And you need His help. And you recognize that. And you're going to call on His name right now and say, God, I need your help to do that. God, if there's something in my life that shouldn't be there, Lord, help me to get rid of it and help me to move on. Help me to confess those things. Maybe there is sin in your life. Maybe it's buried. Maybe you've tried to hide it, but the Lord knows all about it. And every once in a while, your conscience is pricked. You remember that thing. You remember whatever it is. Would you just confess it before the Lord tonight? Not just to say, I'm sorry. But God, I repent of that. I'm turning my back on that. God, would you please forgive me so that I can move on and I can live my life for you. I don't want to let sins drag me down and hold me back. God, would you forgive me? 
you would like to step out tonight and come, by all means, come to an altar. If you want to just pray there at your seat, I'd encourage you to do that as well. Sister Pam's going to just play through this verse as God is speaking to your heart. Would you move a little closer to God tonight? Would you come back to Him? Would you confess those sins? Would you ask for His help? Whatever it is. Let God have His way in your life. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for your word. And Lord, I thank you for including in your word the good and the bad and the ugly. Lord, thank you that we can learn from these examples that you've given to us. I'm so thankful that we can look even at the mistakes that other people have made in their life and we can learn from those things in such a way it keeps us from making the same mistake. Lord, I pray tonight that you would help us to be what you want us to be. I pray that we would be so sensitive to your Holy Spirit that when you speak to us through your word or through preaching or through your still small voice, that we would readily listen. That we would give you our undivided attention. Lord, help us to never grow so cold and so hard that we can't even hear your voice anymore. I pray that you would help us to never get to the place where we allow sin to hang around so long that you have to send silver cups to get our attention. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not only take these things that we've heard and learned tonight and been challenged by and apply them to our own life, but Lord, help us this week to maybe share them with others that you place in our path. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you tonight for being here. Thank you for your faithfulness. I hope you have a good week. I'll be praying for you. I hope you'll be praying for me this week. All right, I'll be praying for you. And I look forward to our prayer time on Wednesday and then our revival next Sunday. All right, invite somebody to come and be a part of the services with you. God bless you. Have a great week.